Well, good morning. If I can invite you to your chairs, and as I do that, if I can echo Aaron's appeal, invitation to the Holy Spirit seminar coming up this weekend, we feel this is a very valuable, very uh, important moment of teaching in the life of our church. Whether the doctrine of the Spirit is new to you or whether it's something that you've heard for years, I would encourage you to be there. This is going to be part teaching, part pastoral encouragement uh, that we would experience the person and work of the Holy Spirit in the midst of our church. So regardless of your background in this topic, I would, I would encourage you uh, to make a priority of Friday and Saturday. If you can only make it to one, make it to one. If you can make it to both, make it to both. If you possibly can, love to have you there uh, this Friday. Well, if you'd open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, continue to pray that this book will imprint its teaching on our hearts, on our church's character. This morning we're going to be looking at the end of chapter 3, which is a, a conclusion of the first half of the book of Ephesians. In this case, the men historically who did the chapter divisions uh, got this division exactly right, and that at the end of this prayer, Paul turns to begin to apply what he's been talking about in the gospel. This is the, the conclusion of Paul's description of God's glory revealed in salvation, in eternity, saving people, in bringing the church together as Jew and Gentile, every nation to bring him glory on display before the supernatural powers. And then he prays at the end that all of these truths would be applied fully, experienced fully in the life of the church. And then in chapter 20 and 21, Paul seems to be overcome by the worthiness of God who has brought all of this about. Uh, because these verses are connected to the prayer Aaron prayed last week, I want to read the, the full prayer, and we'll focus on verse 20 and 21. Let's begin in verse 14, of chapter 3. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let me take a moment and ask God to help us. Lord, Glorify yourself through your word, by the power of your spirit. Receive the preaching of your word as an act of worship. Receive the hearing of your word as an act of worship this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. What do you think is the cause 
of the superhero phenomenon in this country and increasingly around the world. What do you think is the cause of that phenomenon? You may or may not know the billion dollar industry that the superhero movie making has created. It is uh, <laughs> incredible the amount of money that Marvel Comics alone has generated because of this fascination with superheroes. And of course, it's not just current, it goes back decades. Decades and decades, there has been a fascination with superheroes, supernatural beings. Why do you think that is? And there might be a lot of reasons. I even heard that, that children, they, they, they did this one poll of children, what do they want to be when they grow up, asked their parents. And the top category that children want to be when they grow up of all the categories is a superhero. It beats out police officer, firefighter, and any number of other astronauts. Superhero is the one that most comes to mind. And of course, when you grow up, you give up the idea of being a superhero, but you are no less fascinated by superheroes as evidenced by the passion and money spent on superhero movies. Why do you think, why do you think there is this fascination? Why? Why, why superhero movies? Why? Well, I think one reason is that in the heart of a human being, there is a hunger to know and worship the supernatural. I think that's one reason. Now, obviously, in our culture, it's distorted. It's, it's pointed towards imaginary superheroes. But there's, there's something of a desire to believe and to love and to worship the supernatural. There, there's something, even in the midst of our rationalistic, scientific age, post-enlightenment, it, it's fascinating, isn't it? Post-enlightenment, that there is still this fascination with the supernatural. Isn't that interesting? You would think that these kind of movies would be, would be laughed to pieces, and yet they're not. They, they generate massive amounts of income and revenue and media marketing and toys and costumes and t-shirts. And even if you're not a, a supernatural comic book kind of person, you can appreciate this hunger as well. Maybe, maybe you're a nature person, and you like going out and being in the woods because something happens. There's something that you sense and see, and, and there's an echo of something in your heart. Maybe, maybe you're a person that you like reading history, and as you read the scope of history and the sheer vastness of the nations and kingdoms that rise and fall, that there's something of a, a power that, that echoes something in your heart. And it just gives you something of a, of a thrill. There's a, sort of an awakening that happens. What is that? What is that thing that we, we look beyond the natural confines of our ordinary everyday life? We, we want to see, we want to sense something greater. I think that is something intrinsic to what it means to be human. You might be an artist and you see things in paintings and it just echoes a, a hunger for something beyond the ordinary. We were made to worship supernatural glory. We were made to worship. And when you're made one way, you cannot ultimately change it. That's the limitation of being a creature. You can distort it. You can point it in a different direction. You can try to ignore it. You can subdue it, but you can't remove it. It is who you are. When you are made some way, it is never permanently erased. And we were made to worship, to love, to be in awe of supernatural glory. And that is precisely the resounding chorus that Paul is echoing in these two verses. Paul is doing what he was made to do. Having written these three chapters describing the glory of God at work in salvation and in the church, Paul now explodes in the thing he was made to do in worshiping supernatural glory. 
This passage is essentially about God receiving unlimited glory because of the unlimited power on display in Christ Jesus and the church. That God must receive unlimited glory because of the unlimited power at work in Christ Jesus and the church. That's what, that's what these verses are saying. And they're a capstone, a conclusion for the three chapters where Paul has been describing and describing. You remember in chapter 1 where each time he would describe the work of one member of the Trinity, he would end by saying, to the praise of his glory. The Father did this to the praise of his glory. And the Son redeemed us to the praise of his glory. And the Spirit marks us as God's own to the praise of his glory. He says it over and over, and then he he reaches this passage, this lengthy passage describing God's creation of the church that displays to the supernatural powers of the angelic world his wisdom beyond all fathoming. And then he reaches the end of that passage, and he begins to pray that the full application of the gospel would be felt in the hearts and minds of the believers in Ephesus, that they would know God's power, the strength through his spirit. And then he says that the, the fullness of God would be on display in you, and then he explodes, and here's the result he says to the praise of his glory to him who is able to do beyond what we could ask or think exactly what i've described in these last three chapters what no man could conceive of god is able to do and what's the result to the praise of his glory god must receive unlimited glory for his unlimited power on display in Christ and his church. Now, I believe we run a great risk in this church, as in every church in this country, of believing in a natural kind of Christianity, a natural version of following God, a naturalized enlightenment version of Christianity. I believe that's our great risk, our great temptation. I'm not the first one to say that. The greatness of God is often lacking in the Western church. Natural religion is that type of Christianity which can be conceived by the human mind, accomplished by human willpower, and and results in human applause. It's natural Christianity. It can be conceived by the human mind. It can be accomplished by human willpower. And it results in human applause. It is comfortable, tame, predictable, and comforting because it gives humans the sense that they have fulfilled their religious duty. It mutes that sense that we have connected to the divine, built into the human heart. And so many, many thousands and thousands of Christians attend churches, and in those churches, sadly, in some cases, there is this sense of naturalism that is not connected in longing for the supernatural display of God revealed in the gospel and intending to be revealed in his church. Incredible. Tragic whenever that's the case. The true church is hungry that God's supernatural glory would be put on display. That's what the church longs for. And how do we avoid this naturalistic Christianity, this religious check-the-box kind of version of Christianity and move into biblical Christianity where we are encountering the living and all-powerful God displayed in his gospel? How do we do that? How do we do that? How do we how do we look like Paul? How do we look like Paul in this passage? He didn't write this just for his own personal testimony. I believe he wrote this this worship moment at the end of this prayer to inspire the Ephesian church and to inspire us. This is what it's about. How do we become like Paul? Well, I believe we have to do two things. We have to believe in God's power and we have to desire God's glory very transparently what the sections of this final worship moment do. They, they, they reveal what Paul is about. He believes in God's power and he desires God's glory. Notice what Paul does here. He says, now to him, and as he likes to do, he interrupts himself. He's about to say, now to him be glory, but then he wants to give one more reason. Why, why should God be glorified? Now to him, and he talks about God's power. 
So believing in God's power is crucial to becoming who we are meant to be as a church. We will not glorify God adequately if we don't believe in his beyond comprehension power to do what he says he will do. Now to him, Paul says, who is able to do far more abundantly. That's an attempt in English to get across this idea in the Greek. Far more abundantly. It's beyond anything we could imagine. Far more abundantly than anything we could ask or think. Now, Paul has just asked. Remember, you've got to have the, the context of this prayer in view. Think about the profound prayer Paul just prayed. Highlighted and climaxing, as Aaron mentioned last week, in this incredible request that the Ephesian church would know and experience the fullness of God in their midst. What a request that they would be strengthened with power by God himself in the person of the Holy Spirit, that the fullness of God would be displayed in them. This is no mere prayer to make it through next week. This is not merely a prayer to avoid certain kinds of grievous sins and basically to maintain a status quo Christianity. This is a prayer to experience the fullness of the infinite God in the context of a local church incredible prayer and Paul says he is able to do to bring about to accomplish more than we could ask abundantly more than we could ask or even what we could think our imagination is not the limit of God's ability God is not limited by what we could imagine him doing in a local church he's able to do more than that the commentator Harold Honer says, in other words, his ability far surpasses not only what we verbalize in prayer, but also beyond our wildest imaginations. Now, the asking and the imagination here has to be set in context. Context informs what kind of imagination Paul is talking about. This is not Ferrari imaginations. This is not mansion imaginations. This is not even, I, I pray you would give me perfect health and a lack of suffering at all in my life imaginations. No, the imaginations focused on here is the context of the prayer Aaron brought to us so excellently last week that the, the God we're worshiping would be active and seen and known in our hearts and in the context of our church. That God is able to do the things Paul just prayed beyond our imagination. He's able to strengthen us with power through his spirit beyond our imagination. That Christ may dwell, and Aaron did such a great job explaining the full application of the gospel being applied there. That it would not just be a mental ascent or a, a milk kind of Christianity. That it would be fully applied in our hearts. That he would dwell as the owner of our, of our hearts. That he's able to do that beyond our imagination. That we would have strength to comprehend God's love beyond knowledge, beyond our imagination. That we would experience the fullness of God beyond our imagination. Th that is what God is able to do beyond our imagination. To reveal himself. If we want to worship God's glory, we have to begin by believing what he has power to do in his church. Paul has this vision of supernatural power creating revival in the church such that God is known and loved and magnified and people are strengthened to love him more and hunger after him and to see the full implications of the gospel and to know the love of God that surpasses knowledge that, that ordinary natural Christians would experience the supernatural extraordinary God and that that encounter would be beyond anything they could ask or think. That's what Paul has in view. He's saying there are, there are no limits to what God is able to do in revealing himself to to a people who come to him. No, no, no limits to what God can do. There's been a few times in my life where I, I moved across the country. Um, and I, I, that's, that's seemingly what God had for me is to move, not just short moves, but across the country moves. And, and, and sometimes, you know, when you drive those large trucks, they put a governor on them because they, they frankly don't trust people like me to drive them too fast. And so you are, are going on this highway perfectly fine and you're, you're accelerating and all of a sudden you reach a point where the car just won't accelerate anymore. It stops. And I 
it can be frustrating because you might be at a, a place where you could go faster and the cr- truck says, no, you will not. You, you, it feels almost like a person waving its finger. You are not allowed. This, this is your limit right here. No more, no more than this. Here's where you are. You stop. See that line? That's you. That's it. You have a governor on the amount of speed you are allowed to experience because we don't trust you very much and we'd like you to stop right here. Sometimes I think we, in our minds, believe there is a governor on what God can do in his church. Sometimes we believe it's because he's not able to do it, and sometimes we're afraid that if he did do it, it would be much more than we could handle. Well, let's just put that out of the way right now. It is much more than we can handle. It, there, there is no handling the power of God. I'm not talking about chaos or disorder. I'm talking about our, our natural capacity to control and manage and experience a sort of, of governed Christianity is not in view in the Bible. Christianity is not us managing our life in just the right proportion of supernatural power to fulfill our sense of of need for God, but not more than we can see and perceive and rationalize and have control over. That, That is not what the Bible speaks to when it speaks of biblical Christianity. There is no governor on the power of God and what he is able to do in his church. There is no governor to how much of God he can reveal towards his people. There is no governor to the depth of the gospel that can be shown to Christians. There is no governor to the fullness of God that can be displayed. And Christians must not want there to be. So let me encourage you, if you've believed that there's a a governor, maybe a governor of appropriateness, maybe a governor of control, maybe a governor of of a a sense of uh, (laughs) thus far and no farther, Lord, this fast and no faster, Lord, I'd like to grow this much but not more. I'd like to see this much but not more. This is as far as you go. Take the finger down from God's face and tell him, no, no, you, you can go as fast and as far and as deep as you want. No holds barred on the glory of God and his power to display himself to you and to me. He is not limited. And, and perhaps... You're coming from a different place where you think, well, I don't think he wants to be limited, but I have so messed up my Christian journey that if he wasn't limited once, he is limited now. This is where the word and not our emotions and not our guilt must inform our thinking. He is able to do far more abundantly than all that he's not even limited by the requests we make he's not limited by the weakness of our faith he's able to do more than we ask he's able to do more than we think He's not limited by what we think or what we ask or the weakness of our faith or our history. He's able to do more. He is not limited. Here's the profound truth that's present there. God is not limited by you in working in you. God is not limited by you in working in you. He's not limited by your former failures. He's not limited by your struggles. He is not limited by your weaknesses. He is not limited by your circumstances or your family circumstances. He's not limited by the size of the church. He's not limited by the giftings in the church. He's not limited by the country the church is in. He's not limited in his power. He is able to reveal himself in his fullness. God is not limited by you in his ability to work in you. Your failures are not a governor on the power of God. 
he is able. Now, let me just set this up so that we don't just nod our heads and say, yes, I believe God's power. Let's make this very, very personal. Is God able to reveal himself in his fullness in your life? Question number one. And question number two, do you want him to? Don't answer quickly. Beware the God on the other side of that question. Is he able to do more than you can ask or imagine? And do you want him to? How do you begin to want him to? Well, there are many biblical answers to that question, but one we can get from the text is that you desire the glory of God. You desire the glory of God. Point number two, you desire, you believe in God's power. He's able, he's able to do this. He is able to do this. He's able to do this. He's able to do it in you. He is able to break up the rocky ground in your heart. He is able to reveal himself to you. You might not have been a faithful Bible reader for decades. He's able to do that in you. You may have had a sin category that you struggled with for years that the gospel is not fully realized in your life. He is able to change that in you. You may have had an anemic view of God's glory and the depth of his love for you and battled guilt and condemnation for years. He is able to reveal in you the depth of his love beyond all height and reckoning. He is able in you to do that. He is able to, but once you remove the self-imposed governor on God's ability to work in your life, in your mind, and you invite God to do more than you could ask or think, he's not limited by our asking, but often he delights to respond to fresh requests of faith. Is he able? Yes, he is. Do you want him to? Well, not if your goal is to have only so much of God so that your life is not turned upside down towards eternity. If that is our desire, then we'd better not ask God to do what he's able to do. But the Christian life is about saying to God, I want to have my feet firmly planted in heaven. Would you do what you were able to do? And the motive that generates that kind of frightening request is that we desire God's glory. That's what Paul says here. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Credit for the power on display belongs to God alone. The credit for the spiritual life of the church belongs to God alone. The subtle motive that natural Christianity has in establishing a controllable Christian life, the subtle motive is that the Christian gets the glory. The subtle motive behind positive Christian thinking, be positive so that you can have a positive life. The subtle motive behind that all is that Christians, and rather than God, gets the glory. The Bible will have none of Christians getting the glory. Biblical Christianity is about God doing what people can't do for his own glory. About God doing what people could never imagine for his own glory. Biblical Christianity is the Christianity of Gideon, so that God takes the weakest person and reveals his strength through him. That God takes the barren couple and Abraham and Sarah and creates a nation through them. Christianity is about the weakness of people being the platform for God's power on display. So if you want to glorify yourself, you will not desire God's glory. But if you want to be a platform for the glory of God to be on display, you'll pray like Paul. To him be the glory. Let's notice this. How is this glory displayed? How is it displayed? The sphere is twofold. 
It's displayed in the church. Paul moves upward, or you might say he moves backward. He starts with the church, which has been the creation of Christ, and then he moves to Christ, which is the source of that creation. These are, these are linked and unseparable spheres of glory. You cannot say the glory of God is revealed in the gospel without believing that that gospel created an entity, the people of God. You cannot say the glory of God is seen in the entity, the church, without connecting it to its founder in Christ. So Paul wisely, as a pastor, says that there's two spheres of glory where God's glory is displayed on the earth. In Christ, that is in his person and work and creating in history a salvation stream that will rescue humanity and those who believe in him. And the creation of that that is made visible is the community of Gentiles and Jews and people from every nation that have been linked to Christ in his salvation. So the Christ sphere of glory means that God, Christ is the agent that brings about God's glory on earth, and the church sphere of glory is the visible evidence, the manifestation of what Christ has built. What one author calls the church the gospel made visible. Very helpful. The gospel made visible. It's revealed. It does not create itself. It is created, and it is created by the person and work of Christ. But this and here alone is where the ultimate glory of God is revealed. So you cannot have a church that expects to be the platform of God's glory unless it is a church centered on and built by and focused on the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's why any church that is not proclaiming and believing and living the gospel is in danger of not becoming a true church. The word church does not make a church. The gospel makes a church. The church must be admittedly about something other than itself. The glory of the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's where the glory of God is displayed. However, there's also another danger that you could have a, a spiritualist kind of Christianity that loves the gospel but is unwilling to be connected to the gospel made visible on the earth. God gets to decide the platform of his glory. God, you might think of it as a, a famous, skilled artist. He gets to pick the venue. And you might show up at a local amphitheater in your neighborhood and say, I can't wait to hear this renowned artist play. But if he's not there, you don't hear him. God gets to pick the venue. And in the Bible, the venue is the church. That's why it's so dangerous for Christians to assume I can connect and, and believe and be a part of God's glory on the earth without being connected to the church. Well, no, because to Paul, the glory is displayed in Christ Jesus and in his church. The spheres of the personal work of Christ and the people of God, the gospel made visible, God is to be glorified and credited through what Jesus did and through the people who are the result of what Jesus did. That in their corporate life, in their unity in him, in their gospel witness, in their loving of one another, in their experiencing the power of the spirit that transforms them from barren hearts to overflowing hearts, in that process... God's gospel is revealed on the earth as being as powerful as he is. And the scope of God's glory, the scope of God's glory that we desire and we reflect back to him as the church is eternal. Notice what it says. The glory, the sphere of it is the church and in Christ Jesus, those are linked, unseparatable. And the scope, the length of it is throughout all generations forever and ever. So that God's glory in the church and in Christ Jesus cannot be limited to one generation. It must go from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next. Now here's how we apply this passage locally in our church. Here's how we apply this these truths that we believe in God's power and we desire God's glory. It means we reject status quo Christianity. 
You know what I mean? It's, it's the kind of Christianity where we put aside certain socially unacceptable kinds of sins, we reach a certain measure of attendance, and we satisfy ourselves that we have experienced a sufficient amount of the power of God, and we're content with that amount, and we don't want to move on into greater and greater sense of the glory of God among us. No! No, we don't believe that. That would be to say that we've experienced all of that which is infinite. We don't believe that. So if you're a Christian and and you've reached a sort of a plateau in your Christian life, ask yourself, do I believe that the Christian life is intended by God to be a road upward seeing more and more and more of his glory? That we become more and more aware of our weakness because we see more and more of our need for his power. Christians never reach a point of independent self-sufficiency. Actually, the more mature you are, the more desperate you are for God. So we reject that idea. The idea that you can attend on a Sunday and and occasionally look at the Bible and and, and basically say, my my life, as long as I don't slip or or kind of dip into any one of these habitual sins that I've fallen into, I, I'm, I've reached a sufficient plateau. No, the, the goal is not reaching a sort of moralistic plateau. The goal is knowing the God who is infinite and experiencing his power increasingly as we read his word and as we, we study his attributes and as we reflect him towards one another and grow in sacrificial service to one another and long to reach the world with one another. I, I remember reading... <laughs> something about the stages of a Christian life. It was something like, the brand new Christian thinks they know nothing. The intermediate Christian thinks they know everything. And the maturing Christian knows how much they don't know. So if you're a brand new Christian and you think you know nothing, you know a lot more than you think because you know Jesus Christ. If you're in that intermediate stage and you think you know about as much as you need to know, let's be corrected by the word. And if you're growing and you believe you know how much you need to know, oh, you're exactly where Paul wants you to be. Throughout all generations, he must receive the glory because Jesus Christ died to save sinners and reconcile them to God and build them into a unified, multiracial community throughout all generations that declares the glory of his saving power in the gospel to the angelic world such that God's glory is put on display week after week in Christians who used to hate him and now love him. That is why if you are over 60 years old, you are vital to this community because you display by following God into your seventh decade, you display, you display a gospel that is not limited to one generation. You display the power of God to sustain people from their birth to the moment they see him. If you are a senior saint, you display that maturing Christianity is not about becoming more self-confident, but more uh, self-desperate so that the glory of God is displayed in you. That's why we need people that are over 60 in the church. I do not like to see it when a church is limited to one generation because the testimony of the gospel is multi-generational. That's why if you're under 20, I want to appeal to you. You have a job to do that I cannot do and neither can my dear friends, the senior saints, because we will be gone and you will be called to proclaim the glory and display the glory of the gospel. You have a job to do. And no, you should not assume that your parents and me and any other saint here is going to be able to do it. No, we we will do it as long as we have breath. But there will come a moment where my breath will give out and I won't be able to be up here shouting and declaring, God is glorious in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Somebody else is going to have to do that. 
If God wills, I'll do it until I, I expire and I can't breathe anymore. But after that, somebody else has to pick it up. Somebody else has to display it. Somebody else has to experience more of the fullness of God. And if you're here and you're under 60, but way over 20, I believe that the phrase midlife crisis often describes people who in a a given situation begin to question the value of their life. Because they're old enough to realize if I've accomplished this much to this point, declining strength implies that I will only accomplish this much in the second half and that's discouraging. I don't want to lose something that I had when I was 20. I want to hold on to it. I want to accomplish something in my life. I want to be something. I don't want to decline. Paul is writing this book as an older man. He has no illusions about physical strength. No illusions about human accomplishment. But his passion for the glory of God is stronger than ever. Let me just give a a word to you. If you're under 60, but over 20, if you're in that range, let me give a word to you. Your task to display the power of God and the fullness of God is not over. It did not conclude when you got saved in college and you had that moment of revival. Actually, I think the older you get, the more you can reveal that God's power is displayed in weakness. Often in life, as we age, we grow more timid. In the Christian life, as you age, you should become more bold. Because you realize that his power is made perfect in weakness. That's why I love it that we had people well over 20 that came on this church plant because they believed, no, 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 you know, you grow more more timid, more self-protecting when you get older. You become more convinced that God's glory is worth any amount of sacrifice, that I'm not holding on to something, that I want to display the glory of God in the church and in Christ Jesus. And I want to encourage you to keep doing that. Who's to say that in your 59th year, you can't witness to someone who will be the next Charles Spurgeon? Who's to say that in your 61st year, you can't share the gospel and encourage a a mother who is discouraged and ready to give up in her task? Who's to say that in your 48th year, you can experience a truth in the Bible that you've never seen before and share that with your friends that changes their life forever? Who's to say that a 55-year-old can experience the fullness of God and initiate a revival in their small group that they never would have been able to see or do when they were 25. Who's to say God is not limited by one generation or one part of a lifetime? His glory must be displayed throughout all generations forever and ever. We must proclaim the glory of God because we believe his power is at work in his church because of his gospel. We must 
display it. We must not be content with status quo Christianity that accepts the natural limitations of human strength and ability and wisdom. We must launch ourselves towards his glory in our workplaces as we witness, in our homes as we worship, in the church as we gather. We must launch ourselves towards his glory so that we can sing with Paul, to him be the glory he was able to do beyond all that we ask or think in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. revered Saint Amy Carmichael had this passion. Elizabeth Elliot says of her, Amy Carmichael's great longing was to have a single eye for the glory of God. Whatever might blur the vision God had given her of his work Whatever could distract or deceive or tempt others to seek anything but the Lord Jesus himself, she tried to eliminate. Let nothing get in the way of the worship of God's glory revealed in his gospel in the building of his church. Husbands, pray for your wives that the Lord would show his power in them and reveal his fullness so that he might receive the glory. Parents, pray for your children that the Lord would exercise his power in them so that he might receive the glory. Pray for your small group members that the Lord would reveal his fullness in them so that he might receive the glory. Pray for yourself that you would cast all distractions aside that keep you from a hunger and thirst for the holiness and glory of God in your life so that he might receive the glory. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. It is the wisdom of God. It displays the character of God and it reconciles people who had no hope of knowing God and sets them loose on a journey to see his glory displayed fully in that cross reconciling sinner and savior and in that message there is power for this earth that must be declared and applied so that he can receive the glory God must receive the glory because of his unlimited power at work in the gospel of Jesus Christ and displayed in his church. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we consciously remove any imaginary governor that we have set on your power, your ability to work in our lives. Lord, we reject any, any hunger for a, a comfortable, controlled kind of relationship with you that says to you thus far and no farther, we are the clay and you are the potter. You do with us as you will, and you receive the glory. Work your power in us so that you receive the glory. Receive the glory for our salvation. Receive the glory for our transformation. Receive the glory for our growing experience of your fullness. Receive the glory, Lord. It belongs to you. Soli Deo Gloria. To God alone be the glory. Let's just take a moment and apply this truth to our hearts. Dedicate ourselves afresh to his glory.
there's two groups before we close that I'd like to just uniquely take a minute and minister to. Um, if, if you are if you are over 60, um, would you just, if you don't mind, um, identify yourself by, by raising your hand. Quick, if you're 60 or over, um, I'd like you to know that we are so grateful church and we need your example and passion now and into the future and I'd like for all of us now to just pray that God would empower you with a unnatural kind of spiritual strength so let me just let's just pray that if we could for these dear friends raise your hand one more time just so people know where you are good let me just pray for you Lord Jesus, we we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we thank you for them. We thank you for the example that they set, simply by the fact that they continue to believe in you decade after decade. And we pray, Lord, for a supernatural strength, that they would be as, as Moses, with their strength undiminished and with their eyesight clear towards your glory. But we pray that they would reflect the testimony of, of many older saints in your scriptures that gave witness. Lord, I think of the older saints that were some of the first to witness you in Jerusalem and, and gave testimony that they have seen the Messiah. Lord, I pray that you would bless these saints and that they would give testimony that they have seen the Messiah. Lord, I pray that you would give them opportunity to encourage younger saints with the faithfulness of your love. The temporary trials are a mist that passes, that your faithfulness stands day after day. The other group I'd like to pray for is if, if you are uh, 25 or younger, would you just raise your hand if you're 25 or younger? Great. I want you to know that we are grateful you are in this church. We love you. We are proud of you that you come and sit and hear God's word week after week. And we believe that God intends to use your generation to proclaim his gospel. And I pray that your passion will exceed ours, will exceed mine. God may call some of you to foreign lands to preach the gospel. He may call you to your neighbors. He may call some of you young men as preachers and pastors. He will call all of you as witnesses to his kingdom. And I want to pray that God would do that in you. So just raise your hand one more time so we know where you are. And then let me, we'd like to all pray for you. Lord, we pray for this, this group, Lord. We pray for them. We thank you for them. We pray that you would revive their hearts. Lord, if there's any that are here uh, out of obedience to their mom and dad, we pray you would save them. We pray you would show them your gospel, that they would not just be here because mom and dad are here, but they would be here because they love you and they want to follow you and they are passionate about you. And I pray, Lord, I pray, especially for those that are in their teenage years and beyond, that you would give them a zeal and a, a an uncultural passion Lord, an, an extraordinary willingness to be made a fool for the sake of Christ. Lord, I pray for that, that in their habits and in their patterns of behavior, they would reject the kind of commonplace Christianity that surrounds them. Lord, that's the air they breathe. Lord, I pray you would rescue them from it. I pray you would set them ablaze for your glory. Move in their life, Lord. But I also want to pray for those that are in, in midlife, Lord. I, I pray that you would encounter them with fresh zeal. Move in them, Lord. Move in them. Give them a passion and a zeal to proclaim you. Lord, let them reject the kind of temptation towards spiritual caution that comes with growing age. Lord, I, I pray they would reject that and they would 
cast themselves upon you, that you must be proven strong in their weakness. Move in our church, Lord, we pray. We thank you. In Jesus' name. Please know that, as it says in Hebrews, uh, you make pastoring a joy and not a burden. And we are very grateful for you and for that. And we love you. And if you possibly can, I hope to see you uh, Friday night. God be with you. Have a grace-filled week.